just want to say thank you to Allie and to Anton, our worship team, for, I got to hear that two services in a row, and it was so good both times. Thank you for leading us so well. We're grateful. Yes. Before we jump into the sermon this morning, I want to uh, give you a little uh, insight of something that's happening beginning next week that I forgot to mention earlier, and that's this. Uh, I don't know about your family, but in my family, Christmas time, Advent season, which by the way begins next week, the four weeks leading up to Christmas, Advent begins next week. It's hard to believe. It feels like it outside that Christmas is coming. But it feels like the time we ought most to be together as a family, yet it often, I feel as if it's the time we're most splintered, most distracted and scattered. So we started last year a focus we call Together at Christmas. It simply means this, as a family, whatever your family looks like, you know, stage of life you're in, uh, as a church family, let's be together this Christmas. Let's not let it slide by where we get to the 26th and we wonder what happened. Let's focus on what matters in your own homes and in, as a church family. What that means is let's make a commitment. We're going to be in worship together. We're not going to miss. We're going to dig into his word and sing his praises and be together as a church family and your own homes this Christmas season. Toward that end, our students and children's ministries have put together some great resources for you. As you leave today, if you'd like to, you can pick up at the kiosk, one of the magazines. It's uh, got devotional ideas, activities for families. It's a great resource that you can pick up today and lots more to come in, in over the next four weeks as we stay together at Christmas. Let's bow now and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we sung the song asking your Holy Spirit to be present, but the truth is you are present. What we really want is for you to open our eyes and minds and hearts and tune us in that you might speak to us through your living word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are a guest or new, you may not know this, or maybe if you've just been coming but don't pay attention, that we're in a study called the story of God a year-long study of the first two books of the Bible, Genesis through Exodus. And we're in a particular part of the series that deals with uh, what we're calling Paradise Lost. We're at the end of that series now, sort of what went wrong. I had a friend this, this week from our church ask me, you know, it's an awfully long time, Pastor Jeff, to be in Genesis. Is it time we move on? I said, you're crazy. We're skipping over all kinds of stuff. There's so much more. We should be in Genesis for the whole year. But I kind of get his point. It's an ancient book. Why spend so many weeks? We're only through chapter 6 or 9. We've been in it since September, but in case you're worried, we're going to be in it a while longer, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> it might seem strange. Why spend so much time in this ancient book? But we've been, I hope you've been discovering this. We've been seeing that Genesis is profoundly contemporary. It lays the foundation for everything that comes after it, including our own lives and our faith. If we don't understand what Genesis is teaching us about who we are and what this world is and who God is, then the rest of the story isn't going to make much sense to us. It's in the book of Genesis that we discover there's a creator God who made all things good and made us in his image and intends for us to fill the earth and reflect his glory and image in the world. In other words, in Genesis, we discover our identity and our purpose in relationship to the creator God. It's in Genesis that we discover the story that sets the framework in which we understand human sexuality Marriage, family, work, relationship to the natural world, all these things find their shape in Genesis. And as we've been seeing over the last few weeks, it's also in Genesis that we discover what's gone wrong, what the problem is, the problem out there, the problem in here. Genesis is profoundly important and relevant. And I think the irony is we keep looking outside to the world to technology, to education, to government, to, well, not so much politics these days, but, you know, to social engineering, to something outside of ourselves to help us answer these fundamental big questions. And again and again, we return to this ancient book, and God speaks to us about these foundational answers. Now, Genesis as a book is divided into two big sections. There's lots of subdivisions and smaller narratives, and you can get lost in the weeds of all the different stories, but think of it in two giant sections. The first section of Genesis is one, chapters 1 through 11. You might call that origins or primeval history. How'd the world get here? How'd we get here? What do our lives mean in, in relationship to God and all of that? The second section is chapter 12 through the end of the book, chapter 50. It's what you would call covenant history or specifically the history of God working through a specific people that he calls to himself through which he'll bless all nations eventually. So origins history and covenant history, Israel's history. What we're going to look at today is the last story in the first section, the final narrative in this primeval history. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. Babel, 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 Babel. Perhaps you've heard of it. 
or heard of it if you haven't read it. It's a story that some scholars tell us sort of gives a mythological explanation for how we got many languages in the world. Well, languages are mentioned here, but it's so, about so much, much more than that. There are estimated 7,000 different distinct language groups on earth today, depending on how you count them. But it's about so much more, as I said. So let's look at Genesis chapter 11. We'll read the first nine verses and then jump in to see if we can understand what God is saying to us in our day. Genesis 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, the setting for this story is referenced in the first verse. It's called the Plain of Shinar. People migrating from the east. So they're heading from east, traveling, and they come to a place called Shinar, the, the, the population center of the world at the time. Uh, this is, in modern-day Iraq, Perhaps you might remember from your ancient civilizations courses as ancient Mesopotamia or the cradle of civilization. You'll see a map here, an image of where this takes place. So between the Tigris and Euphrates River down there in that little blue V there on that river, moving that direction, people settle on the plain of Shinar, coming from the east, heading west, settle in that plain. That plain is uh, the, the Mesopotamian plain. The ancient Sumerians lived there. It's where the nation of Babylon will rise up eventually. It's the place that archaeologists tell us, and anthropologists, of the very first concentrations of population we call cities. The first cities, the ruins of the first cities are there. This is the story of the first city. Now, people have been building cities for a very, very long time. I don't know if you know this or not. There's an archaeological battle going on right now for which is the oldest continuously inhabited city on earth. Is it Damascus or Jericho? I've been to Jericho, Damascus is in Syria. Both those cities have uh, remains that dating back 11,000 years. But there are older remains. Those are just the continuously inhabited cities. You'll see here an image of Pastor Brian and me in a place called Tel Dan. This is the ancient Israelite city of Dan in the northern part of Israel. We're standing on the ruins of, a, of an ancient gate. That's the gate pedestal there where the king would sit as people came and went from the ancient city. Those ruins there are 5,000 years old. But... Before it was Dan, it was a city called Laish. And that city goes back another 3,000 years. So there are 8,000-year ruins in that spot. People have been building cities for a long time is the point. And we're looking at the story of the first city. What I want to look at and call this the man-centered city. I don't just mean, by the way, like the actual physical city. But it's a symbol of something. The man-centered city. We'll talk about that as we go. To understand what's going on, we have to go back in the story a bit. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God says to Adam and Eve, the first humans, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. In other words, that's part of their creation mandate, part of God's command to them, his desire for them, his mandate to them as his good creatures is to fill the earth. And then you heard last week, and Pastor Brian preached about the flood. After the judgment and the flood, God reiterates this creation mandate in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, to Noah's descendants, and he says again, multiply, be fruitful, fill the earth. So apparently God is not interested in like a small little concentration of all people that are the same. He wants us to spread out, fill his creation with people that bear his image. In other words, I want my, my, my world, my created world for you to be filled by you with people who reflect my image, my image bearers. He says it in Genesis 1, in Genesis 2, 
in Genesis 9, and here in Genesis 11, we read that human beings say, let's gather together lest we be dispersed over the whole earth. You see what's going on? There's this rejection or resistance to fulfill the creation mandate. We don't want to spread out. We don't want to multiply. We want to stay together. It's safer that way. It's more secure that way. We'd rather stay huddled up together. It's interesting to me that God is not interested in a homogenous group. He wants a plurality, a diversity of all kinds of people and language over all the earth that would all reflect his glory and his image. But as we've seen over and over in the story of God, we tend to not want to do what God wants us to do. We tend to want to do it our way. We tend to think we know better. Derek Kidner writes about this in his commentary on Genesis. He says, the primeval history here reaches its fruitless climax. As man, conscious of his new abilities, prepares to glorify and fortify himself by collective effort. The elements of this story are timeless and they are characteristic of the spirit of the world in every age. In other words, we've got this new technology, this new ability, we're gonna fortify and glorify ourselves and do it our way. So is it wrong to build cities? Is this story about cities are bad? Don't go to Chicago to see the lights this Christmas. It's evil. We should all move to the you know, rural areas. That's our new movement as a church. We're going rural. No. Cities in and of themselves aren't bad. But the man-centered city is about something different. Let's go back in the story a little bit. Genesis, 6, or Genesis 10, verses 6 through 10. Now, Genesis 10 comes before Genesis 11. Did you know that? Uh, Yes, it does in the Bible, but it actually overlaps it. Some parts of Genesis 10 are prior to Genesis 11. The latter half of Genesis 10 is actually after Genesis 11 when God disperses them. We're going to read here the part that comes before, verses 6 through 10. These are the description of the sons of the descendants of Noah. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Zebteca. The sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod, a very unfortunate name. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and the land of Shinar. Now, Nimrod, if I called you a Nimrod, that's not a compliment, right? <laughs> Nimrod, just, I can't say the name without giggling inside, Nimrod. But it's in the Bible, right? Nimrod was uh, referred to as a mighty hunter before the Lord. doesn't mean that God was pleased with him. It means that of all the men on, that got on the earth, he was powerful. He was ambitious. He was arrogant. He was self-promoting. And he established an ancient kingdom, a prehistoric kingdom. The first city mentioned is Babel in the land of Shinar. In other words, the story of the Tower of Babel has its roots by this, this sort of um, self-promoting, arrogant, defiant, violent man named Nimrod. That's who established the city in its beginning. And as the people migrate, they settle there. Let's build this city up bigger. Let's do something great. In fact, Nimrod's name is in Hebrew is Na Marad. It means the rebel. An aggressive, rebellious, arrogant guy. That's the spirit in which the city was established. And in, in uh, verse 4, this is sort of the centerpiece of the whole story. You, you need to understand verse 4 of chapter 11 if you're going to get what's going on in this Tower of Babel story. But let me read verse 4 for you again. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. That phrase, let us make a name for ourselves, that's crucial. What does that mean? What does the ancient writer mean when he says, let us make a name for ourselves? Well, probably not much different than what it means today. How do people make a name for themselves today? What are some names you know in our culture? If I call out a name, you probably know where it comes from, right? Chris Bryant. Come on, NL MVP. Cubs? No? We need to take a little time out on the sermon here. Right? LeBron James. Yeah, I will go no further because I might get myself in trouble. People, there are names we know in our culture for certain things that they've accomplished. To make a name for yourself means to do something, accomplish something, build something, achieve something that in some way gives your life significance or meaning. It might not be on the national or global scale, but at least in your little part of the world, I feel good. Build your own business. Your 401k. Where you live. You know what I see in my own life and in many of yours? 
I make a name for myself by how well my children are doing. If they're succeeding, I feel good. I'm significant. My life matters. The, the ancient people did it differently, but it's going on all the time. Now, there's nothing wrong with human achievement. You know these reference to bricks and mortar here in the story? That seem, seem a little weird to you? Well, in the, in the Mesopotamian plain, it's hard to find stone. So they built things out of bricks, but they were mud bricks, and the mud bricks don't last. They crumble and wear out. So they had figured out how to fire bricks uh, and harden them, and then they developed mortar. For the first time in human history, they had new technology to build things that were stronger, more permanent, and would last. It's not a bad thing. The problem is, this whole endeavor... This whole endeavor and project is apart from and in opposition to God to make a name for ourselves. How do you make a name for yourself? I'll give you an example from my life. You'll take this on faith now, but I used to play college football. And I, I know you don't believe it, but I did. And I was, pretty, I was okay. It was a small pond. I was an All-American for two years. I got my name on the Wheaton College Hall of Honor. I don't tell you that to brag, but to, well, there's a point, I hope. My son is now attending there. And I remember when they had the induction ceremony for me before he was attending and playing there. I took him to see the plaque. They put your name on a plaque and stick it on a wall. My name. It's just a plexiglass plaque on a wall, but it was a big deal to me. And I took him there to see it, and I couldn't find my name. I, I, it, was, it was right here on the right side, I remember. It was gone. I stared at every name. There's tons of names, you know. And I couldn't find my name. Now, this sounds ridiculous to you, I know, but I drove home, and I was really messed up about that. My name, my name is missing from the wall. It's just a wall, nobody cares. Nobody even knows who those names are anymore. But in a way, for many, many years, I was trying to make a name for myself through that kind of achievement, that kind of accomplishment. That's a terrible way to find your significance. That's no, that doesn't give you what you desire. But in the ancient world and in the modern world and, and every throughout human history, we are all trying to carve out something that makes a name for ourselves. That's what's going on here. Now, there's something else in the story. By the way, my son found my name later and told me about it, so it's still there, in case you were wondering. You know, tiny. There's something else going on in the story. It's in the center of the, of the city is this tower. They build this tower with this top in the heavens. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of the Tower of Babel. Maybe you think of like a skyscraper. See an image here of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world today. This is the city of Dubai. This is not a made up drawing, it's a real city, in Dubai, in the middle of the desert, there's this tower that's however many hundreds of feet taller than the Willis Tower, I forget. Pastor Brian and Pastor Bruce have been there. Remember that Tom Cruise movie, the spy, I don't know what spy movie it was, but he jumps off the tower and it's that tower. Anyway, I can't remember the movie, but it's, uh, I think they built it just because they could. It serves no purpose. It's in the middle of the desert. They just built it as like a monument to look what we can do. So in a sense, that's what's going on here, but it's not a skyscraper. The next image you'll see is of what's called a ziggurat. This is what they're building. This is a reconstruction of a 5,000-year-old ziggurat in ancient Mesopotamia, right in the region we're talking about. Not the very one. It's not old enough. In other words, it's the stepped pyramid perhaps you see in the history books. Unlike a pyramid in Egypt, which is really a tomb, it would have shafts and, and chambers that would have burial chambers and so forth. This is all filled in, and it's just a massive tower going up as high as they could make it. And next to it would be a temple complex. Now, we read this, and the temptation, for many years I thought this, the temptation is to think, oh, I know what they're doing. They're trying to ascend, build it high so we can go up to the gods. That's not what a ziggurat was for. A ziggurat in the ancient world was not so man could go up. It was built so that God could come down. In other words, it was, think of it like a divine elevator that only goes one direction. They build this tower to symbolically draw down the favor of God or the gods. P divine presence. That's what they're after. Build the biggest city and the biggest tower to draw down the most favor from God. Then we'll know who we're significant. Then we'll know we're important. Then we'll have a name for ourselves. In essence, they're trying to do something that's good. Think about it. Remember Genesis 3? What happens in Genesis 3? Uh, we, we rebel, God pronounces what we call the curse, but it's really just spelling out the consequences of our own rebellion. And the final word of those consequences is this flaming sword. Remember this? You can't go back to the garden. In other words, you have lost, we have lost the divine presence and favor of God that we had before we sinned. We can't go back to that. 
There's a sense in which these people in Genesis 11 are trying in their own strength and by their own ingenuity to reclaim what was lost in Genesis 3, to get back divine favor and divine presence. You just can't do it that way. You can't do it by your own strength, imagination, ingenuity, hard work. Because the city, the temple, is meant to be a place where God's name is made great. Not where we make a name for ourselves. It's meant to be a place where his name is exalted. Not where we exalt ourselves. God, by the way, ironically, is going to reestablish all that was lost. In fact, next week, that's the Advent story in Genesis 12. God comes, and not by building a big city where they can ascend or he can descend, but by calling out one man named Abram out of a pagan nation called Ur to follow him. And through that man, to, to give him a child of the promise against all odds to his, his shriveled up wife and him as an old man, to give them a son. And through that son, to make a people called the Israel, the Hebrew nation, that would be his people. And through that people, to give his law that would t- describe his goodness. And through that people, ultimately to bring the Messiah. God's plan is unbelievable. It's beautiful, but it's not anything any of us would come up with. We build a tower. God says, I'm going to do it totally different. I am going to give back my presence but not how you would imagine. Not on the basis of your strength, but through my grace, through working with fallen people. So it's important for us to see this is not just a story about God going, ooh, I don't like human beings accomplishing so much and I'm I'm slapped down their pride and confused their speech. There's something actually really pretty powerful going on in their hearts here, which speaks to our hearts. Thomas Traherne is a 17th century metaphysical poet. I'm sure you you probably read a lot of those. I don't, or didn't, until I found out about him because he was quoted in a book by C.S. Lewis. See, you laugh, but you should read Lewis. So anyway, Traherne wrote this book called A Century of Meditations. It's 100 meditations on life from the Christian perspective. And they're really brilliant. Um, My favorite is this one. The noble inclination by which man thirsteth after riches or dominion is his highest virtue when rightly guided. I realize I lost you at thirsteth. Let me go back. So, the noble inclination, the good desire by which we thirsteth or want, desire, riches and dominion, power and money, wealth, that's actually coming from a good place, he says. It's just, it's just misguided. Here's what he's saying. That place in us that wants security and significance and meaning and power, that is God-given. We just, go, we just try to fill that in all the wrong ways. It's our highest virtue if we guide it right. What's happening here at Babel? They say, let us come together. Remember this? Let's come together. What do they want? They want community. Let's be together. So that we're not dispersed because it's dangerous out there. So they want security, community and security. Then they said, let's build something that's never been built before that will last. They want permanence. And then they, they want security. Community, security, permanence, and let's build this tower to bring back divine favor. Think about that. They're, what they're after is community, security, permanence, and divine presence and favor. These are not bad things. I would suggest we're hardwired by God to want these things. The issue is you cannot get them in the man-centered city. You cannot make them. You cannot accomplish them. You cannot achieve them. You must surrender and receive them on God's terms, not demand them on your terms. That's the central message here. Let's look then at why God comes down. Verse 5. Verse 5, we're told that God comes down. Did you catch this? That strike you as odd that God comes down? I mean, is it like God's up, up in heaven doesn't know what's going on? He hears a ruckus? What are they doing down there? Let's go see. No, like, 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 like me, right? I'm upstairs, my wife is out of, out of the house, my kids when they were little are in the basement and they're doing stuff, and I'm aware they're down there, and I can tell by the tone of their voices that it's probably not good what they're doing, but I'm watching the game, and until I come down, I don't really know what's going on, right? That's not what's happening here. Verse 5 is like ancient satire, ancient literary satire. In other words, it's saying this to us, your greatest achievement, human beings, the best thing you can do is like God going, Oh, let me come. Oh, I see what you did there. Good job. Nice try. 
It's puny in his sight compared to the glory and majesty and power and greatness of our God. Our best effort to make a name for ourselves is, is he has to condescend and it's nothing. It's just nothing. It amounts to nothing. And in verse 6 then, God graciously confuses them. He graciously interrupts their project. In other words, he knows that though their desires are coming from a good place, they're going in the wrong direction and left to their own designs. That's what it means when it says nothing they try will be impossible. Not that they're going to have superpowers, but that this will go on and on and on and get worse and worse, and so we're going to stop it. God in his mercy graciously interrupts our best efforts to achieve something on our own. Can you make that personal for a minute? Can you look back at your own life? In fact, I want you to right now. Think back over your life. Can you, can you think of a time when you see it now that God was graciously interrupting you, graciously confusing you because you were headed in the wrong direction? Although at the time you thought, this makes no sense. Why is this happening to me? Can you think of a time like that? I can. I'm married to the best woman in the world, with apologies to all women present today. Right? <laughs> When I was in college, just out of college, I was dating a girl that I thought was the one, for sure the one. God graciously, graciously interrupted that relationship and confused it. It wasn't my choice. I thought, what's happening? Why is this happening? Now I look back and I'm so grateful that he was redirecting my life. And countless other times, I thought I was doing what it was right to do, what, I, what, was, what was good for me, and God graciously interrupts. I think on the macro level, for all humanity, he's doing it in Genesis 11 here. We're stopping this. This will not end well for them. It'll only end up in more selfishness and oppression in the man-centered city. So let's look last in the few minutes we have at the God-centered kingdom. The contrast of the man-centered city is the God-centered kingdom. St. Augustine wrote a book called The City of God. Perhaps you read it or read Sparks notes about it when you were in school if you had to read it. Um, it, it, this is written during the fall of the Roman Empire. Rome is collapsing. And Rome was the light. Rome was civilization. Rome was the hope of the world. And Rome has fallen apart. And so Augustine writes this book to say, don't confuse. There's always two cities at, at work in the world, the city of God and the city of man. Now they overlap. And they often, sometimes they cooperate. Mostly they conflict. But they're not the same. Don't confuse Rome with the city of God. Don't put your hope in the city of man, in other words. The God-centered kingdom is different Every city has its ziggurats, its places of power and significance. I don't just mean physical structures. I mean those places that we go in our lives to make a name for ourselves. The message of the gospel is this. We do not come to the man-centered city to make a name for ourselves. We come to Christ who redeems us and gives us our true identity and name. And then he sends us out into the cities of the world to make his name great. Can you hear the difference? We don't come to anything that, that man makes to find out who we are, to feel like we're significant. We come to Christ, and because of his grace, we realize we are significant in his grace and love and mercy. And then he says, now you're ready. Because if you don't know your name, you don't really know who you are, the man said, the city will eat you up. Your business your quest for achievement, your marriage, your family, those things will chew you up if you're trying to make them your place of ultimate significance. But if it's in Christ, then you're ready. Then God can send you out there to make his name great. That's what's happening here in this ancient and contemporary story. Let me explain it further. The key to understanding this is the phrase when it says that God came down. Did you notice that? God says, let us, another thinly veiled reference to the Trinitarian nature of God, let us come down. And so God graciously interrupts us in Genesis 11. He comes down. And then later on, at the end of the story, toward the end of the story, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, God comes down again in a different way. You remember the story. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected before he ascends to heaven. He grabs his disciples and he says, watch and pray because I'm going to send the Spirit. I'm going to come down in the Holy Spirit. They don't know what that means, but they just do what he said. They watch and pray. And then at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit, God, comes down again. This time, he fills them all with his spirit, and what do they do? 
They speak in tongues, not weird space languages, but the tongues of earth, many different earthly languages, so that the people there would hear the one name of God and his greatness proclaimed in their language. You see how that's a reversal of Babel? In Babel, it's many languages to make a name for ourselves. At Pentecost, it's, I mean, it's one language, excuse me, in Babel. In, In Pentecost, it's many languages to make the one name great. He comes back. And then he comes back again. He comes down. In in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 13 through 15. I had not seen this before this way. I'll read these verses to you. Therefore, let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do you catch that? This is speaking about Jesus. He was taken outside the city to be crucified. Do you you know that? In Jerusalem, he was put on trial, but Golgotha, the cross, was outside the city gates. Why is that significant? Well, you might know about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Hebrew tradition of laying hands by the high priest on the scapegoat. Have you heard of the scapegoat? The scapegoat, the priest would lay his hands on the scapegoat's head and would symbolically confess the sins of the people on passing them onto this animal. And what happened to that animal? This is the one sacrifice that was not slaughtered. All the other ones were slaughtered. This one is taken outside the city and sent away. Just go, right? To separate the sins from the people. Jesus is that scapegoat taken outside the city. Think of it this way. What this is telling us is Jesus was taken outside the man-centered city and crucified so that you and I could be brought into the God-centered kingdom. Jesus was taken out of the city to be sacrificed so that you and I could be brought inside to his family. Jesus was cast out and rejected so that you and I could be brought in and accepted. That's what's happening here. That's why the author says, we don't seek a city, that, we don't, we don't, a, a city that's a lasting hope for us on earth. There's nothing that this earth has that will really fulfill us or give us a lasting hope. We seek the city that is to come. What's that city? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because it comes back at the end of the story of God in Revelation 21. Did you know that it, the story of God ends with another city? Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now listen to this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I hope you're still paying attention. At the end of the story of God, there's, we don't float off to heaven and get wings, whatever that, you know, like, like, the, like the common myth. Our hope is not that we float up somewhere and are like little weird angels. Our hope is this. That which was lost in Genesis 3 is coming back fully when he returns. The city returns, and we inhabit it, and he inhabits with us, dwells with us. Our, our greatest longing fulfilled in him. Let me close by reading to you a quote by none other, other than C.S. Lewis. He writes this in Mere Christianity. He says, imagine yourself a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof, and so on. And you knew those jobs needed doing, so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Redoing the foundation, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards, you thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. We we think God comes to us with a paintbrush. Got to clean you up a little bit. He comes with a jackhammer to tear us down and remake us. 
And that, that's the message of the gospel, friends. You don't go into the world to try to figure out who you are. You come to Christ. He tears down all your false identities and remakes you into something beautiful and then sends you out, us out, to make his name great. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this ancient story which is so relevant for us. Give us ears to hear. Forgive us for looking out into the world in all the wrong places to find out who we are. We praise you that you and you alone are the only one who knows our true name. We thank you that as you redeem us and remake us in your image, you also send us out to make your name great. So we praise your name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.